ready why I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> <coughs> so no one put their hand up, so who wants to be here? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Is anyone left outside who's waiting for to come in? Or are there most people are here now? Yeah. I think it looks like it. Okay. Oh no. Can you hear the sound? Is that loud enough? Very good. So again, welcome to uh, the first talk of this uh, meditation retreat here. Uh, this place was specially designed uh, as a retreat center. It's not a hotel. It's not sort of a camp. It is uh, a retreat center. So you have nice food, nice facilities here. And hopefully that you are warm enough and well enough fed here. <coughs> so uh, once we look after the physical part of your well-being, again, if you're too cold, uh, there's always many blankets. Uh, we have a couple of people who are wearing the blankets. Uh, Susan, would you like to stand up to model the latest <laughs> fashion in meditation blanket? <laughs> so these are just nice little shawls you can put on around you in case you get a bit too cold. But hopefully, because you know, for for me this is just perfect temperature, just like this. But for many of you, you've come over from uh, Hong Kong and from. Uh, Indonesia, where it's much warmer. So if you want to turn the aircon on or uh, turn it up afterwards, please go and ask Christine. Eh? And then she can turn it up to make it comfortable for you. So how is it so far? Is it too cold for you or too hot for you? Good, okay. Very good. If it gets too hot, you find that during the meditation, people are falling asleep because the heat tends to get you a little bit more dozy. Too cold, you get a bit too stressed. So we try and find a, a middle way, so it's not too hot and not too cold. So just uh, sometimes you can do that with clothes and you know, put some more clothes on. If it's too hot, you can take some clothes off, but not too many clothes off, please. I'm a very sensitive monk. <laughs> and find that nice, comfortable middle way. Number two is sitting on the floor. You don't have to sit on the floor. Oh, please, find a nice chair. All the chairs are all stacked up, but you can uh, take the chairs out and just uh, sit on the chairs. The chairs are also very comfortable for you to sit on. Oh, for those, oh, very good, excellent. We've got some chair people. The chairs to sit on, it means that your body can relax and doesn't feel any or too much pain or discomfort. So I'm very happy if people will, you know, use those chairs. Sometimes you can alternate between the chair and the floor or like, no, no one's done this yet, but you know, it usually happens, or just sitting on the floor but leaning against the wall which, you know, it's okay, but uh, that makes you reasonably comfortable. And if you can do that, it means that your body can get relaxed and at ease. Even the symbolism of relaxing, as I said, I think the first uh, day yesterday, because some people came early, that you can imagine, visualize a string, especially a guitar string, which is stretched really tight. Or the other simile which I used was like the, the skin of a drum. If that uh, skin of the drum is really stretched tight, then you hit it and it makes a very loud sound. It's tense. So little things get amplified. A little ache, a little pain, a thought, or a sound. When you're very tense, a small things become very huge. But when you're relaxed, when you don't wear things tightly, then things happen and you don't get that sort of reverberation. 
I remember just giving a, a talk at an executive uh, conference here in Perth, and afterwards one of the executives, they took me aside and they said, you know, I was brought up in a Catholic convent with nuns. And he said, I look at you, and I look at those Catholic nuns, which I used to be taught by. And those Catholic nuns were so tight. Every part of their clothing was belted up, was buttoned up. Everything was just so compressed and tight. And just like their teaching, you had to do this, you had to do that. It was so disciplined, so fierce, and I hated it. And I look at you, Ajahn Brahm. There's nothing buttoned up at all. <laughs> Everything is loose <laughs> and falling off. And he said, that's the difference. And I thought, that's a very good perception to understand. To really relax. You button up. It gets so tight sometimes inside of you. So just learn how to relax. So you have the chairs if you need to sit on the chairs. The floor if you want to sit on the floor. We've got the cushion. And I just noticed coming in here, there's still lots of cushions left. So there's still more cushions. And see, as the weekend or the week goes, see if you can rise higher and higher. Another <laughs> cushion up here, a cushion up there, a cushion somewhere else. But the point is to make the body relax. Because when the body is relaxed, then actually it becomes, uh, feels very, very happy and very pleasant. If you go to hospitals, now when you go to hospitals, they don't put you on just wooden benches. You have nice, soft pillows and soft mattresses and a little thing by the side of your bed which you can actually move it up and move it down, move it this way and move it that way. Even they have in the hospitals these little bed pads. And I thought they'd be very useful in a meditation retreat. So, you know, if, so if you really need to go to the toilet, but you're just about to get enlightened, and getting up will make it sort of uh, disturb the meditation, you can get the bed pad out. And so you can do your business, and you haven't moved your posture, so I'm much more likely to get enlightened. No, we can't do that. We, we haven't done it yet. It's amazing. If you notice, sometimes all these things you suggest out of fun, they eventually happen. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to making yourself comfortable. So it's an important part because then we don't get so tight inside of ourselves. We relax. And when you relax, have you found that when you really relax, you can go to sleep well at night, you're more peaceful, more happy. In hospitals, you have to relax to get better. It's the same to get the body relaxed and get the mind to be relaxed. It's the same principle. Stop pulling and pushing the body. Stop forcing it. So it's the same when you're meditating. Sometimes people have all these ideas of how they should meditate. And they find they can't do any of them. So there is this one uh, lovely uh, way of meditating, which uh, it came from one of those stories uh, in those books which I wrote. And those, uh, that particular story was the story of the, the old emperor's three questions story. And that was, uh, again, for those of you who don't remember that story, that it came from Leo Tolstoy. And I remember reading that story when I was a student at university. And it was this a very wonderful story, which I've never forgot, both in life, but also used it to, to develop deeper and easier meditation. And the Empress Three Question story was, you know, when is the most important time? Who is the most important person? And what's the most important thing to do? That was the story. And the answers, which I hope you all know by now, number of times I've taught this, if you 
don't remember this story, and you've been to my talks and retreats in Indonesia and Hong Kong many times, I think you should get checked out for dementia. <laughs> you must <laughs> be forgetting things. So the Emperor's Three Stories question, uh, when is the most important time? Of course, when I read that, you know, the idea of Eckhart Tolle and the power of now and Buddhism and mindfulness, you know, people didn't even know how to spell mindfulness in those days. But we all know now, when is the most important time? And the answer is lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple of hours to go. <laughs> Which, of course, is wrong. <laughs> the many people on the retreat say, oh, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> the most important time is right now. It's the only time you have. Everything else is fantasies and dreams, memories, projections, and it's not true. Even how many times you've had arguments with someone, who did what, who said what, and we argue with each other about the past so much. We both think we're right. Only one person can be right, but there's no way of finding out. So, a good example of that. When you came in here, you left your shoes outside. Which side of the door did you leave the shoes? Was it to the left or to the right? Was it the back or the front? Where did you leave your shoes? Do you remember? Are you sure? <coughs> when you go out, we'll check it again. <laughs> because I did ask Stephen to jumble up the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we always think we're right. How many times have you gone to a shopping mall, parked your car, and gone back, ah, it's stolen! <laughs> like that. One, one of the first people who came to this, uh, before even Jana Grove was purchased, uh, Bodhinyana Monastery, he came to this uh, monastery just for a few weeks, no, a couple of months, I think, just you know, helping out uh, to build the place. And uh, he wasn't married, he didn't have any family, and he, uh, the only thing he had was a Harley Davidson motorbike. And he loved this motorbike, not because it was like a status symbol, but it allowed him to have freedom. Whenever he just wanted, okay, I've had enough of the monastery for now, he'd get on his bike and he'd just go, you know, wherever the fancy took him. And so he'd travel all around Australia, go to spiritual communities, he was very helpful here because he could do some work, do some cooking for us, you know, and he was, uh, I don't know if he was a Buddhist, but he was a very spiritual person, and when he had enough, off he went in his Harley. And after he had, actually he told me a couple of stories, I'll tell another, oh no, I'll make the other story later when it doesn't fit. And on this particular story, he said he was going doing some shopping in some big shopping mall in Sydney, and he parked his Harley in the car park, went to get his shopping, and then when he came back, it had been stolen. The only thing of value he had in his life had been uh, stolen. And he put down his shopping bags, and he realized that you know, from that moment his life must change. The one thing which gave him freedom, the one thing which he owned which was worth something, had been taken by somebody else. But because you know, he'd learned you know, the Dhamma, learned some teachings, he thought to himself, it's like the death of a loved one. He said, well, I've had some wonderful times with this Harley. I've got some great memories, but you know, nothing lasts forever. I mean, my life has to change now. Those days of freedom, riding around Australia in my Harley Davidson is now over. He actually let it go. And he thought to himself, whoever has taken that Harley Davidson, 
I hope they have as much fun and pleasure and freedom as I had. You know, and he actually let it go. And he, he told me about this. He wrote this, this uh, letter to me and said how, how amazed and impressed he was that he could let something go like that. Now, even though that he was so attached to it and gave him so much pleasure. It is like losing someone who's very close to you, a dear relation. And when he felt just this sense of, oh, this Dharma actually really works, you lose something and you, know, you feel at peace with it. It was only after he came to that recollection and that, that understanding of the Dharma, it's only then that he realized he was in the wrong level of the car park. <laughs> And of course, he went down the level. They look exactly the same. <laughs> and there was his Harley, <laughs> untouched. <laughs> it's a wonderful way of just letting go of stuff. And he could actually do it. <laughs> so, you now with us, you know, when we learn how to let go, life is very relaxing and very easy. So, even with our body, we learn how to relax. And with our mind, because he forgot where we put it. It looked the same. You know you put your shoes somewhere outside, but you don't know exactly where. It's not that important. So a lot of our memories are just not all that accurate. So, uh, we don't need to know, because the shoes are out there anyway. And it doesn't matter, because, you know, we're Buddhists, we share. So if you go outside, look at your shoes, and then uh, I haven't worn these for too long. I'm going to wear some other shoes today. <laughs> you can actually <laughs> change. Yeah. You know, over at our centre, over in Nolamara <laughs> Centre, that we, oh, there was really weird. On a Friday night, people would leave their shoes outside, and they go to the meditation. And when they, uh, they came out afterwards, every week, you know, some lady had lost a shoe. Only one shoe, <laughs> and the other one was there. But the other, you know, she waited. Everybody left, and this one shoe had left, was 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 disappeared. And we really thought, you know, I, actually even me, I was looking to see if there's anyone here with women's shoes, so any any woman with only one leg, <laughs> <laughs> she must be the thief. <laughs> <laughs> and for weeks that went on. And we looked and looked, and we don't know, and it was just, it was strange. Now, who would only, <laughs> who would only would, uh, steal one shoe and not other shoes? And eventually, you know, we found the solution. It was one of the neighbours. She cleaned out the dog kennel, and the dog kennel was full <laughs> of shoes. <laughs> the dog next door and got into the habit of going over to the temple every time everyone was, was, <laughs> was uh, meditating there. And he would sniff, <laughs> sniff it, <laughs> that's the one I want. <laughs> and would take it into the dog kennel <laughs> and hide it there. <laughs> and the kennel was full of its, its trophy shoes. <laughs> and it could only take one at a time in its mouth, and that's why only one was <laughs> left all the time. But anyway, so... The past, you don't know exactly what happened and why. And the future, we don't know what's going to happen and why. So, in this meditation, don't let your mind be fooled on both ends. The past, dragging you, you can feel the tension, all that unfinished business, all that stuff that anger, that upset, being mistreated, not being given a fair chance, all that stuff in the past pulls you this way. And all the, the craving, the wanting, the desires of the future pulls you this way. And so your poor brain is being stretched. It's surprised it doesn't come out of your ears. It just goes, oh, you're so stretched, so much tension inside. So what do we do? Ah, oh, let go of the past. Who knows? It might have happened, it might not have happened. Who knows why these things happen? Who would have ever guessed it was a dog was the thief? <laughs> 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 so 
So you just let the past go. As the future, you don't know what is going to happen. Who would have ever thought that Donald Trump would be the, pro the president of the United States? <laughs> Did you see that one coming? No. And I don't know if you... Uh, maybe a while I've said this about the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Did you hear about that? Really? How many watching the news? <laughs> there was there was <coughs> assassination attempt against Donald Trump. While he was giving a, a talk or a speech or whatever, somebody stood up with a gun. An assassin pointed at Donald Trump. And the Secret Service agent shouted out, Donald, duck. <laughs> <laughs> And just like you, the assassin burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't pull the trigger to save his life. <laughs> You're very nice at coming here, Tony. So, uh, well, it's, it's not Tony, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's Tony, yeah. Your name, yeah. And Andy, that's even better. Because I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to invite you every, give you a free ticket every retreat because your laughter, <laughs> at least somebody laughs at my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me feel much better. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so we don't know what might happen in the future. So because of that, we don't worry about anything. Usually, just the most unexpected things occur. What we never thought would happen usually does happen. And some of it is unpleasant stuff, but most of it is very pleasant stuff. How many of you thought you would be sitting here, sort of in the middle of winter, <laughs> on a re meditation retreat with no TV, with bad internet reception? Not being able to eat in the afternoon or evening or night time. <laughs> Listening to a uh, a uh, a quilo. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, here we are. Life is just so sort of unexpected, and it's wonderful. It's like that because it means worrying all the things you ever worry about. How many of them are worth worrying about? Do they, does it make any difference? All the worry? That's why it was um, one of the great American philosophers. Do you, do you follow philosophy? I'm sure you may, you may have heard of this because he's a very, very famous philosopher called Snoopy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> These are the real philosophers. You can actually understand what they say. <laughs> this philosopher, Snoopy the dog, some of his favorite sayings were that uh, worrying about the future does not stop bad things happening. They happen anyway. But worrying about the future stops you enjoying the present. So you, you don't enjoy the present moment. You're not having a sense of it. And it's usually the case that if you worry about bad things happening, they're usually more likely to happen. So I just, oh, let it happen, whatever happens, we'll deal with that later on. And it's less likely to occur. Oh, what was that other little story about that fear of the future? That was, you know, when I was uh, a lay person, was, I've been a monk now almost 44 years. And so when I was a lay person, to see anything remotely connected to Buddhism was just really hard. And the only show on the TV at the time, which was sort of Buddhist, was that uh, TV show Kung Fu. And when I told my friends, oh, I was just watching Kung Fu, he said, that Buddhist, well, it's a Buddhist monk, why is it so violent every <laughs> week? <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> One of the reasons is because people wouldn't watch the TV if it wasn't about some violence in it. So that's why that... Um, you know that uh, my books continue to be good bestsellers, and 
the one of the first books, the uh, Opening the Door of Your Heart book, that somebody photographed, and it was on the uh, the Buddhist you know, blogs and stuff, that Jessica, no, Sarah Jessica Parker, you know, that, yeah, Sarah Jessica Parker, she was an American uh, actress. She was seen in a coffee shop reading my book, Opening the Door of Your Heart. And that she was, uh, I think, a start of Sex in the City. Is that right? And you know that. How do you know that? <laughs> I'm telling your wife. <laughs> they say, how does Andrew Brum know that? <laughs> Brought to the point. Because <laughs> somebody told me. <laughs> but apparently, so as soon as I saw that, I thought, wow. It's a very famous TV show, and the lead actress, I don't know if she's the lead actress, but anyway, she is reading my book. And I thought, you know, just what fantasies one, talk, one thought to the other. I thought, maybe, maybe she'd invite me onto her show. <laughs> Special episode, Sex in the City, starring Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, how would that work out? So I thought, well, you know, can't have any violence, can't have any sex, can't have any revealing clothing. So we, we'd actually have to change the episode to no sex in the monastery. <laughs> Would anyone watch that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so the reason I had the violence and stuff in the Kung Fu was just to make it sort of uh, more attractive to the audiences. But they did have some wonderful little scenes. And the one I remember, it was all about just you know, what happens when you worry about the future. And that was the, um, I don't know if you ever saw this, but there was um, the blind master. And they had this very, very wise master. And he took the little disciple, the novice monk, Grasshopper. And he said, Grasshopper, now is the time for you to actually to do the next part of your training. And he took him into this this darkened room, a usually kept locked. And you know, young novices always wonder, what was actually kept in there? And so he opened up the door and took this little novice inside. And because the master was blind, he asked, little grasshopper, little grasshopper, what do you see? And he went close and it was like, an indoor swimming pool. He said, oh, I see, there's a, there's, a, there's a pool in here, an inside pool. Go a bit closer. What can you see on the bottom? But be careful. And he went close to the edge. And of course, you know, in my lounge room somewhere in England, I was there watching as well. This is interesting. What was this? A little grasshopper peeped on the edge and said, oh, there's bones down there, Master. There's bones. Human bones. Lots of them. And the Master said, because he was blind, little grasshopper, those are bones of little novices like you who fell in. See that? That's not water. That is very concentrated, corrosive hydrochloric acid. And of course, as soon as they said that, little grasshopper stepped away from the edge of the pool. And I don't know why the psychology of this is, but even I, looking in the, in the TV in the lounge room, I moved back as well. <laughs> <laughs> it was scary. He said, what else do you see, little grasshopper? He said, I see, I see a plank, a plank of wood stretching from one edge of the pool to the other edge, crossing the pool. Yes, said the master. One week from today, you have to do a test which every novice has to pass. You have to walk across that pool of deadly, corrosive, burning, concentrated acid from one side to the other. And if you fall in, there will be more bones on the bottom of that pool of acid. 
pure and poured as a grasshopper was scared. And so was I. <laughs> and, but said the master, we've got, <laughs> we've got one whole week for you to train. You don't have to do anything else. No duties, just uh, balancing. And so he took him outside. There was another plank of wood, exactly the same size and length, and only put on two bricks. Now, practice your balancing. So, little grasshopper, every morning, afternoon, and he, just even one day he could balance no problem at all. Sometimes he would dance up there, sometimes he would hop one leg. And I never saw him do the kangaroo hop because they didn't know kangaroos in that part of uh, wherever it was. But anyway, after one week, he could balance so easily. And then came the time when he had to do the real test. You never know what it's like, you know, when you, know, you can do your sort of examinations at school or university, you know, you could do your driving tests or whatever else uh, you need a test for, and you know, it's really easy, but when it's a big test, people, they just, they just cramp up, they freeze, and they just, you know, they, they just fail every time because it's the real thing. So this time, this time, he told the grasshopper in the room, the, over the real acid, get on the end of the plank of wood. And you could see the little grasshopper was really scared. Because this one little slip and it'd be burning in acid. And on the end of the the plank, little grasshopper. And you can imagine that a plank of wood, the same size, the same length, the same width, on two bricks in a courtyard, is much, much shorter <laughs> when it's the same size over acid. That plank seemed to go on forever. Walk. The little grasshopper started walking. Walking, step, you can see it was unsteady. No dancing, no kangaroo hop now. <laughs> this was serious. And you could see that his, his knees started to get weak. You know, when you, you're walking, you start to shake a little bit. He started to shake a little bit. And then it looked like he was beginning to sway. And he hadn't got even halfway over the acid yet. It looked like he was going to fall in. That's what it looked like. You know what happened? Had a break for the ads. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a commercial break? <laughs> do they still have that these days? It's really mean, isn't it? Because you don't want to know what happened. <laughs> anyway, there's stupid toothpaste. This toothpaste makes you really attractive to girls. This uh, uh, car, you know, you haven't sort of arrived yet until you get this old car. Well, I don't know what advertisements they have all these days. But anyway, I had to wait, wait, wait until the advertisement was finished. And then when the advertisement was back in this, this really scary room, the little grasshopper on this narrow plank walking across, they always go back a few, a few seconds. <laughs> and then it looked like, it looked like he started to lo you lose his balance. His legs started to get weak. He started to shake. He started to sway. And he fell in. The little grasshopper fell into the acid. I thought, oh my goodness, this is not supposed to happen. What's going to happen next? And he was splashing around in the acid and he wasn't burnt. And the great master was laughing his head off. <laughs> so much for compassion. <laughs> there is your disciple is being consumed by acid and you're just laughing. <laughs> and realized you'd make a very good master, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> well, <the people. laughs> but there was but he was just splashing around, it wasn't he wasn't sort of burning him. And that's where <laughs> the master said, Little grasshopper, it's only water. It's not acid. And the bones down there, it's what we call these days special effects. <laughs> Just to convince you. 
And that's when the Master said this wonderful little statement. He said, why did you fall in, little grasshopper? It was fear pushed you in. Only fear made you fall. And I remember that. What a wonderful teaching that was. You can actually just do uh, scans of your neural networks. You can go to see psychologists. You can go and, and uh, do a PhD. But what makes you fall in and fail? Only fear. Nothing else. On that uh, same size of wood on the courtyard, he can just walk across that backwards, blindfolded, on his hands. It'd be no problem at all. You say it's acid underneath, and that's the fear. That is what pushes you in. So this is the past and the future. Don't worry about the future. You don't know what's going to happen. But if you have fear, Fear is always going to make you fall and pain. So, how can there be any fear when Ajahn Brahm is here? <laughs> 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 so, in other words, yeah, it doesn't matter. I've been here and done it. Uh, actually, all the years we've had John Graham. It's, how many years is it? Eight years? Nine years? About nine years now, ten years. It's getting on a bit. But anyway, had no fatalities yet <laughs> <laughs> in this meditation retreat center. We don't intend to start now, so you're perfectly safe. So understanding that means you don't need to worry about the future. You've got food coming tomorrow, or just in a couple of hours. You've got a nice place you can rest. Uh, Loved, cared for, safe. You're not going to be be uh, told off. You're not going to, it's not like one of these Zen retreats where they come round the back with a stick. You don't do things like that. It's very kind, very peaceful, very fun. Nothing to fear. That means you relax. Relax into this present moment. Do you understand? There's an old, another old master story. The master told his disciple, or rather the disciple asked, do you have any wise words? And the master said, okay, my wise words for today, or actually you might say for this retreat, the wise words are, never argue with a fool. Don't argue with an idiot. And the disciple replied, that's not compassionate. And the master replied, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> but anyway, so come uh, in the present moment. But when you're meditating, especially today, right now, is the only time you ever have. It's the most important time in the whole world. It's the only time. Now, who is the most important person in the whole world? Is it Buddha? Oh, is it <sighs> Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> <laughs> is it the cook? <laughs> yes, I think they would say. <laughs> They're very important. <laughs> Is it a teddy bear? <laughs> Is it yourself? No, not yourself. The most important, this is uh, the great uh, Leo Tolstoy. He said, the most important person in the whole world is the one right in front of you now. Whatever that happens to be. So you're the most important person in the world to me now. He's right in front of me. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> what it is, it brings you into this moment. The content of this moment, right now, is the most important thing in the whole world. So, how do you meditate? What are you supposed to be focusing on? 
What should you pay attention to? Whatever's in front of you right now. Whatever that is, is important. Be with it. It's the most important experience in the whole world. Whatever's happening now. What do you do with it? Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm fed up. Oh, I am sick. Oh, I am demented. Oh, I am psychopathic. Oh, I don't know what else you are. So whatever it is, it's important. You're getting to know it. But what do you do with it? And the answer was, it's a care. This beautiful little bit of loving kindness, compassion, to whatever is happening now. And of course, the story behind this. I went to, this is a, a doctor over here in Perth, you know, I went to his, oh, it wasn't actually his house, his friend's house to Adana a week ago, and his two, <coughs> two kids are there, his parents were there, his wife was there, his mother-in-law and father-in-law visiting from Sri Lanka were there, but he wasn't there at all. And you know, his, his name was, I, I don't mind telling you, his name was Sumater. Where, where's Sumater? You know where he was? In Russia, watching the World Cup. <laughs> 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 and the soccer. <laughs> and all his wife and family and everyone was there except him. <laughs> so anyway, but it shows he's a successful doctor. But he was a young man. And when he was a uh, young man, uh, he'd come to the temple. There's always any problems he had in life, you know, I'd try and sort them out for him. But the big problem he had was when he said, I got a resign from being a doctor, can't do it any longer. He said, well, you make a big mistake, not a big mistake, but I just, it's too hard. Because what happened for him, he was the one who, he was looking after, it was only an intern, I think, first year or two as a doctor, he lost his first patient in very tragic circumstances. It wasn't his fault, but you know, he didn't see the signs, it was this young woman, about 23, who died. And that was hard enough, you know, just feeling he didn't see, you know, what maybe could have saved her life. But then he had to tell the news to this young lady's husband. You know, only been married a few years. He was still in the, in the, you might call it the idiocy, the craziness, you know, of love. You know, just you know, love each other so much, depend upon each other so much. Have you seen, you know, your kids in love together? Oh, the most wonderful person in the world. I'm so lucky. You know, you you know that. And he was still in that stage of love, and he had to tell this guy unexpectedly, the love of your life has died. If that wasn't hard enough, the two young children by his side. And you. The children have got no mummy. They're gone. And you can sort of get some idea of just how that felt to be the one who has to say that to the uh, to the family. And it was unexpected. There's nothing he didn't do anything wrong. No one could have done any better than him, but uh, he lost that patient, tragic circumstances. And I remember him coming to me in Nolamala Temple saying Ajahn Brahm, I've got to see you. I can't, I, I've got to resign. I can't do this anymore. I can't face the prospect of having to do that again. It's just too painful. And that's when you told him the story of you've misunderstood why you're a doctor. Purpose, the main priority of being a doctor is not to cure people. Because any doctor, it's only a temporary cure at best. You just put off death for a few <laughs> years. But they're going to succumb. That's when people ask me, what's the, the definition of life in Buddhism? And this is actually not from the suttas. This is somebody else told me this. Life. Life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. 
figure is true, isn't it? The sexually transmitted terminal disease. It's life. <laughs> it's a bit negative, but I've been trying for years to try and find fault with that and can't. <laughs> anyway, so you're going to die. So, and if you really think your purpose is to cure, if that's the main priority, to cure at all costs, you know that happens in our modern system of health? So any resources to try and cure somebody, if you can afford it, doesn't matter just how unpleasant or painful that must be. But, so there's something wrong with it. Your job is not to cure people. Your main job is to care for them. It's a change in English. There's only one letter difference, cure to care. If you want to try and cure someone, you'll be a failure many times in your career. Curing somebody, oh sorry, caring some for somebody, you never ever need to feel a failure. You can always care for someone no matter what. But to cure someone, sometimes it's beyond your abilities. Always care, not cure. Look at me as a, as a teacher, trying to cure some of the monks and anagarikas. And I don't know, how, many, how long have I known some of you? Trying to cure you of your bad habits? Forget about it, Ajahn Brahm. I give up. <laughs> I can still care for you. <laughs> now that's more important, caring, not curing. Now, so I said, that's more important, care, not cure. And he got it. He said also, if you make your life as a carer more important than curing people, their diseases and their illnesses, you will always be successful. And number two, this is a byproduct, the extra little gift, not intended, but it happens. You'll probably cure many more people <laughs> if you make caring more important than curing. I think you can understand that. He's, he's still a doctor, a great doctor. And, uh, you know, he must be a good doctor just because he managed to find time to go off to, <laughs> to, to Russia to watch the soccer. I don't know what team he was supporting because you know, he was Sri Lankan and Sri Lankan don't have a football <laughs> team. You want to know why the reason why the Sri Lanka and other Buddhist countries don't have a football team? They're <laughs> successful. The reason is because they're too compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Indonesia, but you know, to tell, don't ever put any Buddhists in the in the uh, the soccer team for Indonesia. They always just let go. <laughs> let go of the ball. Let, let somebody else have it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so the caring, not curing. So, and that becomes the third thing, third answer. What's the most important thing to do is to care, not to cure. And just ordinary in life, I don't know how many people have problems in marriages, or with kids, or with even your own body. Always try and cure people and cure things and cure your husband. There's lots of ladies here. Take it from me. I'm an expert in marriages. <laughs> <laughs> you will never be able to cure your husband of his bad habits. You will always be able to care for him. And by caring for him, you find he cures himself. can't cure your wife, but you can care for her. And that's when the relationship starts to become wonderful. Your body, cure it, how about trying to care for it? You care for your body, how does it feel now? Do you need to actually to sit on a chair? Care for it. Try and cure it so, you know, you can sit for 10 hours on broken glass, you know, on the, on the hard concrete. So that doesn't work. That's just eager. Caring is more selfless. Looking after your body. When you need to rest, please rest. 
especially the first few days. And then the meditation starts to kick in. So the caring is more important. So that's the, the Emperor's Three questions. Now is the most important time. The one in front of you, the most important person in the whole world, the most important thing to do is to care. What's that got to do with meditation? What are you aware of right now? Now, the most important meditation object in the world. What do I do? Care for it. You try to get rid of it. Try to make it better. Make it that's more curing instead of caring. I gotta cure my mind of its defilement. Stop thinking too much. Stop being restless. Stop being so tired and sleepy. I've only got eight or nine days. I want to get enlightened. I've got many things to do when I go back. <laughs> so instead, trying to cure yourself of its bad mind state, care for it. Beautiful loving kindness. Right now. You find what happens is, number one, it means you can meditate at any time, anywhere, with any state of body or mind. So actually, where I developed this from was when some people said, well, look, you know, I'm sick, I'm in hospital, I'm in pain, you know, but I can't watch my breath. What should I do? But of course you can meditate. You don't need to be sitting full lotus, you know, you're laying on the bed, sort of really sick. And, well, what should I do? What time is it? Now, if, if you want to know about that, you can go into the meditation rooms over there. I, I demonstrated that the first day. The walking meditation over there, it's got a clock in there. You can actually change the clock hands. So, I think I changed it to lunchtime. <laughs> Still lunchtime, <laughs> okay. So look at the clocks in, in the room over there. Oh, it's lunchtime. So go get some lunch, <laughs> even though it's the middle of the night. <laughs> but no, uh, <laughs> so, so now is the only time. So what are, what are you aware of right now? Are you hungry? Are you fed up? Are you tired? Are you cold? What are you feeling right now? Now is the most important thing. What's happening right now? I mean, if you're sick, in bed, in hospital, now is the most important time. What does it feel like right now? And you care for it. Not afraid of it, not try to get rid of it. You care for it. And my goodness, the amount of amazing things I've seen happen in my own body and other people's bodies when you follow that method. That goes to the heart of meditation. Because when you're caring for this, you're not trying to get rid of it. There's no ill will, no pushing away, no, none of the second hindrance, none of the first hindrance wanting something. You're right there in this moment, learning from this moment. It might be unpleasant, but it's much less unpleasant when you care for something than when you try and get rid of it. Or when you want something more, or want something different. You're right here. And just learning from this. And it passes pretty quickly. When you don't fight it, you're caring for it. And then, because you're not wasting so much energy, the amount of energy we waste, I don't mean in our body, I mean in our head. I think I did actually see this in a Science magazine, I think it was like 23, 24%, if I remember the number correctly. The percentage of your energy which is used in your brain. Your brain, uh, com uh, compared to its size, consumes more energy than anything else in your body, than any other organ. And you, you know, see, I, d I don't eat that much, but because my brain now is so efficient, it doesn't think that much, it meditates. Because my brain doesn't use nearly a fraction of the energy it usually would do, 
that means I've got so much surplus energy, which is where this comes from. <laughs> If I could only learn how to worry some more and to think some more, then I would lose weight, like you guys. <laughs> but no, but the brain does take up so much energy. So you can just imagine what would happen if you didn't fight, you cared. Now, as a mo you didn't worry about the future, you didn't worry about the past, you just cared for this moment. What would happen is you become energized instead of tired. Depression, which is just exhaustion of the brain, would start to disappear. You'd wake up energized. Just because that simple, just now the most important time, this moment the most important, just being here and being calm. Brain energizes. When it energizes, your sloth and torpor, your tiredness, disappear. Go away. Ah, clear. Not only that, but you start to get happy. The energy is joy. Joy makes you energy. Sometimes, some people, they need a cup of coffee in the morning. Without that coffee, they're miserable. You wouldn't even want to talk to them until they've had their first cup of coffee or tea. They need a boost of energy. But once you're energized, especially this natural energy, you're happy. Because you're happy, it's easier to be here. You don't need to go anywhere else. Now, like this. So, this is not a second class meditation. This is no, oh, I just do this at the beginning and later on I'm going to the real stuff, watching the bed. Lights and all, come on, that was the real stuff. But no, this gets to the heart of the meditation. Now the most important thing. See how much you can be here right now. The most important person or thing is what is right in front of you here. You want to be just to care for you. So what happens if you're thinking thoughts and fantasies and, and planning what you're going to do next? If it's right in front of you right now, it's important. Be aware of it. Be careful. Oh, it's all right, right? If you want to think like that, that's fine. You know what happens? Oh, many of those thoughts, it's just like an agitation of the mind. When you don't add to that agitation, the thoughts, they just, they just stop. I'll say it later on about the anger-eating monster, but that's a wonderful simile. If you don't give it anger, get out of here, stupid thoughts. Get out of here, uh, tiredness. Get out of here, restlessness. That's what feeds it. Being kind to it. I just make you want to think, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. And then it can't last long. You're peaceful, you're happy, and you are still. Meditation is very easy when you don't try to meditate, when you're not looking to get something, when you're right here in this moment, this is the most important object in the whole world, and you just care. And I did mention this to the uh, first group of people, that's to help you be in the present moment and to develop kindness. We have. To my right, my disciples, many of them, just sitting, actually quite a lot of them, go oh, they're gone. You've got one over here. Still a few left. <laughs> Did you take them back to your room? Ah, <laughs> oh, please bring them here as well. 
You got one there. Are they on the other side? I can't see them. But please, if you haven't got a teddy bear yet, take a teddy bear, you put it in your lap, and it reminds you of the present moment. Now is the most important time. You're right here, and you're caring. And you find it does make the meditation much, much more effective. It works. And that's what, what one of the reasons I was saying, just mentioning it to you in passing. I just got an email last night from the publisher in Wisdom, and it was you know, from the German edition. We got the three of my books are in the top ten bestseller in Germany. Spirituality, the good, bad, who knows, and the uh, Open the Door of Your Heart, and the new one, I think it's number four or something, is Bear Awareness. Uh, bear Awareness. I think you have that in, uh, they call, and they called it Bear Meditation, didn't they? Bear Meditation. Have you got a, a, a Chinese translation of that yet, Della? Bear Awareness? Bear Meditation? Not yet. One day. Live in the present moment. <laughs> it's good enough. So anyway, that's the bear book. That's where it came from. Getting the bear and learning how to meditate with the bear. So it's very popular. So there's a few bears left. <coughs> I've been told by my contacts on Wall Street, it's a bear market. <laughs> No bull. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> okay, so there we go. That's the talk for today. This is morning. All about now the most important time. Whatever's right in front of you, the most important person or, or thing, and to care. Very good. So. Sadhu. 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 <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Okay. So have a wonderful morning. If you're still tired and jet lagged, there's always this wonderful bed in your room. You can meditate in there. Pull that out. <laughs> or if you want to do some walking meditation, or have a cup of tea, just have a walk around. Have a smell of the food. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be very delicious. And the, the meal is at 11 o'clock. That's right, isn't it? Over here, 11. Uh, my meal is over there at 10.30 for people coming. Is it 11 o'clock lunchtime for you guys? 11 o'clock, thereabouts, yeah. But again, just like breakfast, it's, it's not, um, it's they're free and easy, so you, it is obligatory. You don't have to have lunch. <laughs> I don't want to force it on you. <laughs> I don't want to compel you. <laughs> so have a wonderful morning. Eat.